The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The views, information, or opinions expressed by hosts or guests are their own. Neither the show nor any of its content should be construed as investment advice or as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security. Security-specific information shared on this podcast should not be relied upon as a basis for your own investment decisions. Be sure to do your own research. The podcast hosts and participants may have a position in the securities mentioned personally through sub-accounts and or through separate funds and may change their holdings at any time. Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Welcome to a new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Good to have you with us. Uh, great discussion ahead with my co-hosts, Elliot Turner and Phil Ordway. Elliot, why don't I turn it to you to kick us off, please? Great. Thanks, John. Hello, everyone. Uh, good to be here again. Um, we've gotten some great feedback on the last couple episodes, so hopefully, uh, you know, you guys keep it up. Stay in touch. Um I want to talk today about a series of tweets that I put out during the past week. I haven't been tweeting much, uh, but I kind of shared a couple things following um, Meta's earnings. And I think it was misinterpreted by some people. So hopefully I could clarify and launch us into a good topic with that. I started with this tweet. Um, we own founder-led companies because while others are focused on the short-term, founders with the capacity to suffer are willing to sacrifice cash flows in the short-term to invest for the long-term until it actually happens is what I pointed to on that quote. Um, and some people took this as like, um, you know, suggesting that either Tom Russo was buying Meta or that, you know, people who say they have the capacity, look for the capacities to suffer, don't actually believe it. It was really just me being a little cheeky about um, the Facebook situation. So I followed it up with this idea that um, it's called the capacity to suffer for a reason. Um, and founders stick with these choices, even when the market's telling them not to. Um, that's why it's called the capacity to suffer, because you take pains, right? And, you know, that pain is basically saying that you have uh, less near-term earnings with the expectation that you get to a greater degree of long-term earnings from the investments that you make. The problem is, from the outside, we don't really know at all whether the investments will result in a good return. You have several things you could do to judge in advance whether you believe that to be the case. But in some respects, it is a leap of faith. Um, so I suggested that in order to help uh, investors see it through, you need companies with little terminal risk. You need a history of successfully making such uh, investments and sacrificial choices. And you also need a stable shareholder base. You need a shareholder base who knows at the outset that they're buying into a company whose uh, founder that's leading the company very well might make decisions um, with a long-term mindset that lead to short-term suffering. So, you know, I found one of the quotes I uh, liked on Tom Russo talking about the capacity to suffer, where he says, the three prongs that I look for when investing in a business are the 50 cent dollar, the capacity to reinvest in great brands, and the capacity to suffer. The capacity to suffer is key because often the initial spending to build on these great brands in a new market has no initial return. Many companies will try to invest smoothly over time with no burden on currently reported net income. But the problem is that when you're trying to invest in a new market, smooth investment spending really doesn't give you enough power to make an impression. So, you know, as of right now, I think one of the problems is many of these companies who claim that they're investing uh, for the long term and are doing so in a way that's hurting short term profitability. Uh, so, so there are two problems, as I see it in today's environment. One is that the revenue side of the equation has taken a turn for the worse. So the degree of suffering is greater than the initial expectation uh, that was was laid out there to investors on the outset of these investment plans. And I'm you know, really talking uh, specifically about Meta, but I think a lot of what I'm saying applies to 
dozens of companies, especially in the technology space. So the revenue side did not manifest as expected, has taken a turn for the worse. So the magnitude of the pinch on cash flows is even greater than had been com- contemplated at the outset. And the second problem is there's a degree to which the actual investment is more analogous to a bet than outright investment, um, where you don't know and don't have anything tangible to suggest that there will be returns. Um, so one of the pushbacks I got to my tweets is that it's very different to contemplate an investment in a new market geographically than it is to contemplate investment in an entirely new technology that's perhaps related, but not directly uh, tied to the business you're talking about. Um, and, you know, I, I think that there's maybe a little less truth to that, though there is a shred of truth. And I say a little less truth because the world is littered with examples of companies who tried to expand geographically and were not successful at all. And these include great companies with the capacity to suffer, like Walmart and Home Depot, for example. So, you know, I give those as examples because, uh, you know, part of the point was that companies with easy to understand unit economics could push them internationally with with, with um, a little more ease. And, you know, those ones kind of are there, but it's just not that simple. And it might, uh, well, I think one of the things that both those companies did well was they cut their losses early. So you don't know when you should stop the capacity to suffer, but that's that's something that's there. And I think with Meta and with a lot of the tech companies, part of what's going on is the investments themselves increase people's concerns about terminal value because you get questions like, you know, maybe Zuckerberg's doing this because he knows that Core Blue is dead long term, that he's doing this out of desperation to make sure the company could last. That, you know, if he really wanted to make these metaverse investments, he should have sold some of his stock in face the, the company formerly known as Facebook and invested it outside on its own. And so, you know, the inference is that, oh my God, this is a warning sign, not an actual opportunity. Um, so, you know, I think these are some of the problems and some of the questions I have. I'm not sure the degree to which um, any of this is true. I think it's really hard. Um, I think it's especially hard as you have rising capital intensity at core Facebook. But, you know, what I do find interesting is the degree to which there is very strong underlying earning underlying earnings power uh, and how there are ways that we as investors could use our tools um, to say, hey, you know, let's say he burns a hundred billion dollars on reality labs over five years. Okay, so let's mark that off of core uh meta. What's the rest of it worth? And you know, come up with your own assumptions, etc. Um, but you know, I was just thinking a lot about capacity to suffer. The one last uh piece I'd add to this before throwing it back to Phil and John is I think. You know, it's always easier to say you have the capacity to suffer before you are actually suffering than after, than when you're in the heat of the moment. And I say this because I think it's true as investors as well. Um, I know from my own seat where I'm sitting, I felt in certain companies in particular, it would be easy to easier psychologically and emotionally to face severe uh, drawdowns. Um, then it has actually been while it happens. And it's impossible when things aren't going right to ask yourself, am I impossible not to ask yourself, am I wrong? Or is this just part of what I was here to expect along the way? And with that, you know, I'll turn it over to Phil and John for any thoughts on any of the above. I certainly don't have a strong opinion about Facebook meta. Because, and, and you know, it's funny, Elliot, you mentioned at the beginning the feedback you've gotten on that tweet. And we also received some inbound uh, feedback from someone, unfortunately. I mean, the person, whoever it was, was reasonably courteous, but it was an anonymous egg with, you know, four followers. It didn't seem like a bot, one of Elon's infamous bots. It seemed like a real human, but it basically was somebody. Uh, who didn't have the courage to use his or her own name, but felt the need to call 
the collective we, the three of us out for bad analysis, bad recommendations, et cetera. And I thought and it they was were worth- specifically my ideas, by the way, Phil. So I hereby absolve you of any responsibility or blame <laughs> that this person, this egg was throwing at us. Fair enough. That, that It wasn't clear that he knew that, but I think you're right. But anyway, uh, he or she knew that they were yours. But um, I think it's worth pointing out. And I try to do this every time we talk about a specific company or security or idea that if I do have a vested interest in it, and again, I'm a long only investor. I've shorted a lot in the past, but I don't short anymore. I have no plans to short anymore. If I do happen to own something on the long side, I would explicitly acknowledge that at the beginning. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, I have never partaken in one of these conversations where I did, in fact, own something, unless it was something roundabout. I do own Berkshire Hathaway, for example, and we've talked a lot about Berkshire Hathaway and Buffett, et cetera. But in this case, I certainly have no vested interest in Facebook meta um, as it's known. Now, I've always been... I guess the best way to describe it is an agnostic about the company. I I have never had any confidence in my own ability to figure out where the company would be in a very short period of time. And this is a good example of it. I think we can all agree whether you love or hate the company, own it or short it, or indifferent about it, we can all agree that the company had a meteoric rise. And in some cases, and I would argue in many or most cases where a company has a meteoric rise, you have to be aware of the fact that that means you're more prone to a meteoric fall. And it could be because of management missteps. And and we can talk about whether that's the case here. It could be because of the nature of the industry. And I would say my concerns were more on that end of the spectrum, namely that this is an industry that changes quite quickly. This is an industry that's prone to rapid shifts in the way people communicate, the way people consume information, the way that business model is disseminated to its customers, so to speak. And you know, I, I look no further than the fact that this business would be in a far different place without Instagram, which again, when it was bought for a billion dollars, however many years ago that was now, I thought seemed aggressive and it turned into one of the greatest acquisitions of all time in terms of the value it created and the bargain that they purchased in that acquisition. But here we are again, where I think anyone who's not been living in a cave would have heard of TikTok over the past few years. And I I just don't know what's going to happen with TikTok or with anything else in the next few years. And I don't know what's going to happen with the metaverse in the next few years, let alone in the next five or 10 years. And even if I were a gigantic uh, metaverse fan or bull, so to speak, which look, I'll be the first to admit that I don't, I'm, I'm not neck deep in that. I don't understand all the implications of how that might develop, but it certainly makes sense to me as a technology that could develop into something important. You know, that doesn't mean that we're not misallocating capital today. It doesn't mean that I have any idea what the right price is to pay for an asset in that so-called economy. So anyway, the one thing that I will point out is I certainly love the capacity to suffer. It's a beautiful phrase and framework that Tom Russo has coined that is very, very useful. It kind of rolls off the tongue and is an easy one for everybody to remember. Um, And he's obviously exploited it to great profit over many years. I think the key is that, and I, I hope I'm not putting words in his mouth, maybe we could pose this question to him directly. Um, is that if you're going to invest in the capacity to suffer, you generally need to A, be very sure that you're right, and B, you're probably going to be hunting more in areas that are prone to less dramatic change. They're more prone to reversion to the mean rather than these paradigm shifts that you know can come along every three, five, or 10 years and just blow something out of the water, right? I mean, I think one of the primary appeals to him was something like Nestle is that it's survived well over 100 years and is likely to survive for decades to come. And there just isn't very much that's going to blow Nestle out of the water in a short period of time. And and that if there is something that starts to change, it'll be something where he can underwrite and handicap those odds over you know a longer period of time and give him a chance to adjust as things come along, right? Whereas in this case, look, I mean, I know plenty of people that very astutely made relatively early investments in, in Facebook and said, you know, look, if if Zuckerberg ever starts spending above X, that's insanity. This is a business that doesn't need that kind of reinvestment. I would be a seller at that point. And instead, 
you know, here we are, right? I mean, it's very easy to get seduced along the path. I mean, the only other thing that I would call out that kind of runs contrary to the capacity to suffer in this case is, and this is where, you know, we also, I, I, I'll take part of this, Elliot, for sure, with the feedback we got was that, you know, it, it can sound like we're sitting up here just preaching in a holier than thou kind of way. And like, we're never wrong. And you guys are all morons and this management team did this wrong and blah, blah, blah. And look, I, I get it. That, that can be how it sounds. And I think, I hope anyone that's listened regularly would agree with the fact that we, and I, I do mean all three of us, and and I hope I'm included in that, try to be very upfront about the fact that business is hard, investing is hard, and we all get things wrong. I've certainly gotten things wrong. I've made lots of mistakes. I will continue to make lots of mistakes. And so as, if I sit here, it's not lost on me as to how ridiculous it is to be calling out Mark Zuckerberg for anything because he's had enormous success along the way. And who am I to be criticizing anyone, let alone someone with his level of success? That said, if I were in his shoes or if I were one of his advisors or directors or employees or friends or whatever along the way, and I, I have said this in real time and I would I would say it to him in, in real time or in hindsight, it's just very aggressive to be reinventing the company, literally renaming it, literally trying to reinvent it to the tune of tens or potentially a hundred plus billion dollars of spending. While at the same time, you take debt from zero to 25 billion. And while you buy back, what's the number now, Elliot? Like $60 billion of, of stock and, and doing that buyback on a very aggressive, on in a very accelerated timeline and doing it in a pandemic, doing it at all time highs, which look was also Right, just slow the pace the of buybacks now after having gone <laughs> you Correct. Know, very aggressively right. last year. And they were buying back the stock to really just offset dilution. Like, let's be honest, they shrunk the share count by something like five to 10% at the most and spent tens of billions of dollars to do it when they knew they were going to need tens of billions of dollars to do this metaverse pivot. And so, if you're not making an investment in the stock, you're just covering up the dilution. Maybe you need to reevaluate why that dilution is there because look, it's an expense. You need to pay your people, but you know, this has been well trod territory for us on this podcast. And I've always been a pretty significant critic of lots and lots of stock based compensation. I think the benefits are obvious, but the downfalls that we're all seeing right now in this type of market have been kind of papered over for a long time. And when, when markets are going up and valuations are exploding, it looks like free money. And then all of a sudden people wake up and realize that it's really not. And so anyway, my, my pushback in, in criticism to this company or this idea and this, in the construct of what we're seeing right now with Facebook and Meta is just that it was an extremely aggressive move to do all of this at the same time. Look, I think the capacity to suffer is, is huge. Like this company does, does have it's still to this day i mean a very powerful business and it's not going away overnight i'm not saying that at all and it's smart to say okay you know we're starting to see some cracks in the foundation here let's rebuild the whole house let's shore up the foundation from the bottom up and make sure we've started from scratch and and really dug in here i mean that's exactly what you'd want from a forward thinking management team but to do that at the same time that you've done these other things is just probably doubling down on too much risk for my liking. Yeah. I mean, I wonder whether um, the innovators dilemma applies here, you know, I mean, that's a nice concept, but then when somebody maybe tries to do it in practice, uh, it's not uh, very well received because you are basically, um, you know, changing the company uh, on the fly and that seems to be going on uh, with Meta here. You know, the other thing that investors often talk about is they want companies, uh, kind of high ROIC companies, but that also have the ability to reinvest a lot in their business. And, you know, Facebook is reinvesting uh, like few companies. Obviously, it's totally unclear what kind of return, if any, they're going to get on that reinvestment. And that's that's obviously the, the problem here. But conceptually, you know, if you think Zuckerberg is ultimately a, a good capital allocator, he's kind of demonstrated it in the past. Um, you know, I don't think um, you necessarily want to ascribe a value of zero 
to all this spending. Um, so, you know, that's just uh, something to consider. Um, and when it comes to the capacity to suffer, I think, you know, it's easy to sort of throw that term around and if a company is going through a rough patch or management is kind of misallocating capital potentially to call it a capacity to suffer. Um, so I think we have to be a little bit careful about where that uh, actually applies. You know, it's not, it, it, it's kind of, you know, it's it's really the capacity to suffer in the short term. It's not the capacity to suffer in the long term because it's not the capacity to be stupid, right? Um, I mean, you got to make sure that uh, what you're doing is going to pay off. And, um, you know, clearly with Facebook, um, with Zuckerberg in control, he can kind of drive this in whatever way he wants. And just um, statistically over time, you know, founder-led businesses where the founder um, has a say and doesn't have to uh, respond to um, the market's uh, kind of short-term thinking, um, I think those companies do end up doing better in the long term. And those are, I think, the kinds of businesses that someone like Tom Russo likes to seek out. Now, as as you guys pointed out, it can be different when you know you're suffering through something that's fairly obviously a short-term thing and the market's just kind of focusing on near-term headlines versus something where you're transforming the company completely or uh, you know trying to to invent a whole new technology. And with regard to Meta, I just wonder if there was a way to do this more incrementally where you could kind of see more progress as you invest in this. Right now, it kind of feels like this humongous bet and, and there's very little feedback. Like basically, it feels like in a few years, we're going to know if this was totally idiotic or not. But um, you know, if there had been a way to kind of do it more incrementally, I think that would could have been potentially a lot smarter. So that's a really good point, John. And I, I it raises a related issue that I was going to bring up too, which is, you know, everybody loves to compare the so-called Fang stocks, right? The big mega cap tech companies, and you guys might know this better than I do, but um, I think it's worth considering where these companies came from and what they said they were going to do right at the outset versus where things shook out, you know, 5, 10, 20 years later as conditions changed and as people changed and as these became world altering, literally world altering companies worth trillions of dollars. And so when you look at a company like Amazon, you know, go back and read a history of how Jeff Bezos founded the company, what his aims were, what his goals were, read those first couple of shareholder letters where he laid everything out. And then look at what he did over the next 10, 20 years and look at where the company stands today and compare that to this and compare how they invested in something like Amazon Web Services, which to your point, John, was much more of, you know, look, he, he's Bezos and, and Amazon at large are very willing to spend lots and lots of money and be very, long, very wrong. They've had many bets that didn't work out, but, you know, this wasn't like they shut down some important business or diverted spending from A to B to go all in on Amazon Web Services as a pie in the sky dream when it was potentially still very early, right? So I think that's a very good point that you raised. Likewise, at Google Alphabet, you know, that there the parallels are also quite interesting because they also changed the name and they've had this crazy moonshot division where they've been investing billions of dollars over many years with frankly not a ton to show for it in a lot of ways. Um, but it's certainly not been to the same detriment. They they haven't had the same problem, I would say, right? That that Facebook and Meta have had so far. And then I and, and likewise, I mean, I think if you read the early uh, history of Google, it's it's even more similar to Facebook because, frankly, they just kind of stumbled into one of the world's great businesses. I mean, let's be honest, Facebook was started as this kind of weird little almost sketchy project in Mark Zuckerberg's dorm that, you know, it's not like he dreamed up the, the, the world's greatest advertising business in his dorm. The, the, the means were much more prosaic back then and his goals were much more sophomore. So it's not like we can give him credit for that level of clairvoyance, which is fine. I mean, many, many of the world's great businesses are born out of something totally different and totally unrelated, right? I mean, it's a total myth that 
the you know most successful businessmen all just wake up one day with some absolute epiphany that then they go carve into reality. So that's not what I'm saying at all. But I, the parallel between Google and Alphabet are quite clear. But if you read the the founders, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page's early writings and their thinking, and you know the, the the fingerprints of no less a company than Berkshire Hathaway are all over the structure of Google and Alphabet, right? So now let's go to to Facebook, right? I mean. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it true that when this company came public and and even ever since that Zuckerberg's always had the attitude that this wasn't a company and that he really didn't have any regard for shareholders and that this was an idea and a, you know, a social project much more than a traditional shareholder oriented company? I don't know. I I, I don't don't know about that. But, I'll uh, have to go back into the share. I'll have in the show notes, then I'll try to link to it because it, I'll be to honest. To me, I didn't it sounds more that in like, advance, but yeah, to me, it sounds more like Jack Dorsey. <laughs> I mean, well, that's true. You know, sure. Zuckerberg <laughs> has run a very profitable business from very early on. And, and that's why I always kind of thought of it as much more shareholder oriented than even a Google, um, although that's been super profitable as well. So I don't. I, I'm not sure about that. It's funny the amount of times. Speaking of Jack, that I, um, you know, in sharing my thoughts on Twitter through the years, people said, "Why not just make your life easier and buy Facebook?" Because Zuck's a ruthless capitalist, and Jack is a uh, money burning hippie. <laughs> and um, you know, look where we are today. Uh, there is no. Um, I, I'm not uh, saying. You know, I got anything right with Twitter because it would probably be a ten dollars stock had it not been for Musk uh, in this juncture. But it just goes to show how it's just not that simple, especially the Facebook side of the equation. Um, you don't know um, how the market's going to value any of these assets at any given time. And one of the realities of um, Facebook slash Meta that is unlike Twitter, and I think it actually helped in Twitter's case quite a bit uh, in two ways, is that Facebook, Zuck has total control. Um, There is no way that anyone in the world could buy enough shares and still outvote Zuckerberg. But Twitter never had A and B shares, and so it was always a truly public company in that sense where um, you know, were they not appropriate stewards? And, and especially given the fragmented ownership, an activist like Elliot could come in and insist on some changes or, uh, you know, a, an influential billionaire like Elon Musk could buy enough shares to effectively force the company to sell itself to him. Um, so I do think there's a degree to which, um, you know, I think one of the wake-up calls of this all is you invest in a company like Facebook, you are along for the ride with the founder and your say doesn't matter um, from the outside shareholder's perspective. He very well might have called it a social experiment early on, but I do think, you know, in his years as, as a public company operator, um, his communication has been very clear along the lines of they operate this business to make money until... You know, I, I still think he'd insist that's the case with the metaverse investment. He thinks it's the biggest opportunity he's ever seen in his life. Um, so why shouldn't he put his money behind it? I think the contention would be, you know, do it in, a, in an entirely different vehicle so that your shareholders could, um, you know, make the conscious choice of whether or not that's something they want to do. And not just shareholders, but employees. There are a lot of employees who have a lot of stock in uh, what's now Meta, who worked at Facebook who all these years, who have considerable portion of their own wealth in it. And they have to see um, their work tied to something that they may or may not believe in. Um, so I think that's that's challenging. And I, I, I do see a lot of flaws with the way it's, it's structured. And so my capacity to suffer was like really tongue in cheek. Um, but, I, but I do think it's Related to this notion that, you know, John, you referenced it, but, um, you know, founder-led companies, you you want to invest in people who are founders, who have the ability to make very long-term bets, who have the ability to um, see it through even when there are doubters. Uh, the problem is the market could punish you quite viciously along the way. And uh, for Zuckerberg, you know, I think even if the stock were down another 70-some-odd percent, 
it wouldn't change his life at all. So he has no reason to even think about changing what he's doing so long as he believes. Um, but the reality of it is, you know, for the stock, it would have been a lot better had he made it a small bet with testable metrics of what he would choose to uh, use as signals to lean into it farther, as opposed to just a massive upfront bet. You know, by the end of next year, he'll have invested well upwards of $20 billion in it and to earn their cost of capital and need over $2 billion of annual contribution. And it's hard to fathom a path to that degree of contribution coming from the metaverse anytime in the near future. Um, so that's really hard to underwrite to. So to circle back on this, I found what I was referring to earlier, and it was almost exactly 10 years ago. It was Zuckerberg's original letter to shareholders filed in conjunction with the S1 in 2012. And again, I think this is worth, I'm not trying to overstate this, too much. And I agree, he's actually been a very effective capitalist. Um, I think that may be somewhat more ancillary to his purpose in life than, than people maybe give him credit to if they're fans of his. And, and here's why. So this is taken directly from the letter in the filing. Quote, Facebook was not originally created to be a company. It was built to accomplish a social mission to make the world more open and connected. We think it's important that everyone who invests in Facebook understands what this mission means to us, close quote. And again, only he knows what he meant by that. But if you want to take a glass half empty view, which I kind of do, because, you know, look, we, we've talked a lot about puffery and, you know, claptrap in the corporate world. Let's be honest. I mean, that. He's 100% correct in the first sentence, which is that Facebook was not originally created to be a company, right? This was like a, you know, a really high IQ, frustrated 19-year-old trying to, you know, look up all the girls in his dorm kind of thing. And then again, through no fault of his own, I'm not being critical of that at all. It turned into one of the greatest businesses of all time. But then to say in 2012 that the mission of the company is to make the world more open and connected and to kind of stick with that line over time when it was very clear that that was, uh, again, like not really what mattered. I, I think that, and, and look, it could be that he genuinely believed that. I, my response would be that a lot of executives in his position, uh, I'm not throwing stones here. I could very well be one of them if, if I were somehow in his shoes it's very easy to believe that, that you're actually doing good here and actually making the world more open and connected when the evidence, certainly in the last five years, is that this has been probably far more negative than positive in terms of the world's dialogue and openness and connectedness. But I think a lot of executives, and particularly of these very powerful media companies, and that goes all the way back to newspaper magnates back in the day, they develop a God complex. And they really think that they are doing... God's work and providing what the people need. And, and they're the conduit of truth and information and light. And so I think he probably sees the same thing as being true for the metaverse. He sees it as the next great leap in communication. And he's in his own way willing to suffer, right? I mean, it's definitely the ultimate capacity of suffer to capacity to suffer because he's saying, I will do whatever it takes to get through to that other side. And you may believe that, you may not believe that, that's totally up to you, but it's different than what I think a lot of investors have signed up for, which is just this money-making machine, right? The ultimate business, which again, Facebook in a lot of ways was, or is in some ways still. Yeah, I think God complex uh, could be right. Um, you know, I, I have a pretty cynical view on on the kind of the mission t to connect the world. I think he believed in that probably just to the extent that it would be a, a way to make a shitload of money. Because um, I'm not sure you'd have things like Cambridge Analytica and all kinds of other stuff if you really just cared about your mission of making the world better by connecting people. Right. Right. And look, I mean, there, there's plenty of other things here that give you clues as to like, the, I've always said this, and I, I do think it's true. I think people lose sight of it is, is that what the mission of the company, and I, I mean the mission mission of the company started out to be, does matter. It, it at least matters through a full generation of executives, right? So if Zuckerberg were no longer the controlling shareholder, no longer the CEO, then we could have a debate as to whether or not it still mattered. But 
we're not actually a company, we're a social mission to make the world more open and connected still matters. It's still relevant to Facebook today. Move fast and break th- break things still matters today. Uh, the hacker way still matters today. Done is better than perfect still matters today. I mean, those were literally things that were painted on the walls, like imprinted on corporate materials everywhere you look at Facebook. And so those things still matter and you have to decide whether that's a vision you align with as an investor or not. Absolutely. Elliot? Yeah, it's always hard to judge some of those things, right? In the beginning, move fast and break things could theoretically be incredibly smart. You want to not be bound by certain uh, certain rules. And uh, at a certain point, you become someone who's uh, earned, for better or worse, so much trust that move fast and break things is way more bad than good. And it's hard to give up on those things. And I think back to Google with don't be evil, which is no longer the mantra there. Um, But certain things come with really complex, nuanced uh, requirements. And just because Google gave up don't be evil doesn't mean they would believe that, but it's really hard to take and hold certain conflicting uh, opinions or policies um, and not risk being called evil by someone. And, um, you know, yeah. So, so I think there's a certain point where you could like look away from certain initial callings, but at the same time, I I think you're totally right. Um, this whole idea of opening the world, uh, socially, I mean, they are what even they themselves have held up as a walled garden. Um, so they've actually closed off considerable portions of their, um, ecosystem. And that's part of why I'd, uh, I and I think others had called Zuckerberg a ruthless capitalist to that extent because it was an incredibly shrewd um, and lucrative move financially, <laughs> but it was not in the spirit of openness. Um, so, yeah, no, I think uh, you raised some really good points about this all. And, and the don't be evil things, fascinating. That's a great point too, because I remember when they came out with that, and I was really confused. And it look, it proved that. A couple of things. I mean, it proved that they were forward thinking, right? And that, I mean, look, everybody's always had forward views about the potential dystopian nature of all manner of technology. So I guess that's not novel or interesting, but it was a a little bit jarring, I think, for your average non-sophisticated investor. And I would certainly include myself at the time about Google specifically, which is that like, oh, this is this happy little search engine and they have email and they have stuff and like, what would be evil about that, right? And look, I actually think Google and Alphabet have not done anything even remotely. I don't, I wouldn't put them in the category of bad actors by any stretch of the imagination. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there with a sharper take on that, that, and some of them might be on the other side of that debate. But look, all big companies with lots of human beings involved end up having bad things happen. It's just the nature of humanity. People are messy. People make mistakes. A certain subsegment of people do bad things for all sorts of reasons. That's just life. I totally get it. And I I, don't, I wouldn't hold Google and Alphabet out as a negative example by any stretch of the imagination. I do think it's fascinating that they started with the don't be evil thing at a time when it didn't seem necessary. And then they dropped it later when it would have been a lot more relevant. And now people hardly think of it or hardly talk about it. But anyway, another really interesting way is that I, I'm just scrolling down to the end of the letter, the S1 letter from Zuckerberg. You know, he talks about all his goals. Um, well, he starts, he goes through this kind of interesting conversation about engineering as he starts about our mission and our business. And he says, simply put, we don't build services to make money. We make money to build better services. And that's great. I mean, I think that aligns with the playbook for most great companies. I think most great companies want to do something where the money is the measuring stick and the financial returns are part of an obligation to their stakeholders, but it's not the end all be all. And then he walks through the hacker way and how they, the culture is open and meritocratic and um, he, he kind of keeps on going, but then he goes into focus on impact, move fast, be bold, be open. And he closes with build social value and says, once again, Facebook exists to make the world more open and connected and not just to build a company. So again, 
we can all have our own take as to what that means, but I would argue that he meant that and still means it. And I think that has pretty interesting implications. Well, Elliot, final words. Yeah, that is interesting. That make money to make services, I guess, is how you build a perpetuity in technology when certain things don't last forever. But um, it is uh, it is interesting. I, I should have reread that in light of uh, this conversation in advance. I'm glad you put that out there, Phil. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Phil and Elliot, for another great discussion. I hope everyone listening enjoyed it as well. Take care for now. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.